Got it. All right, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here and talk with you about a um, project that I've been working on with uh, Joshua Rohn, my partner, um, my creative partner, for the last 10 years. So um, we are creating photographs of glass sculptures placed on the landscape to inspire people to preserve and protect their watershed. And why won't it go to the next slide? There we go. So uh, why is the watershed important? Uh, well, the obvious thing is that the water supports plants and people and animals. And 50% um, of our bodies is water. Right? But that water is just on loan. Um, while the planet is 75% water, only 3% of that is useful, uh, fresh water. And of that, uh, only 3% is accessible. A lot of it is in the atmosphere or deep underground, but 3% is accessible fresh water. And of that, um, only 1% is stuff in our rivers and groundwater. So what is this word watershed? Well, the watershed is all the land where the water that falls on it goes to a common stream, lake, ocean. And the a Mississippi River watershed, or actually it's the Missouri, Mississippi, and Ohio, or uh, MOM, um, is 41% of the continental United States. So to get a kind of graphic of how this works, you, you can imagine folding a, a map in half on the Mississippi River and then fold it back diagonally on the two great mountain ranges. And you can see you've formed a funnel that goes right down into the Gulf of Mexico. So anything we put on the ground anywhere in that 41% of the country could theoretically end up in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And you all know about the dead zone and how the excess nutrients and plastic pollution that we are uh, washing down into the Gulf is uh, creating a hypoxic zone where fish and other aquatic life can't live. And another concept about watershed, it's really watersheds, plural, and they're like those um, Russian nesting dolls. There's a smaller watershed inside of a larger one, all the way down to the puddle in your driveway is uh, a watershed. The map on the right, um, is roughly this, what is the red square on the larger watershed. And this is uh, my area around Alton and the little red star is where my house is in the Shields Creek uh, or Shields Branch uh, watershed. And you can see the topography of the land kind of sketched in that map so that uh, not as dramatic as our folded map, but it, um, funnels all the water into the Shields Creek and then down into the Mississippi River. So uh, what we're doing with watershed cairns is to kind of make visible that system of, of water. And especially speaking to this group of uh, scientists uh, about water, uh, the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center, I kind of wondered, you know, what does an artist or what does the artistic or artful process have in common with uh, the kind of scientific research that they do? And one of the things when you think about what it takes to make art, um, imagine learning to play a musical instrument and or a particular piece on a musical instrument, you will go over a section of it until you get it 
right? And then you play it in the whole piece and then you decide, no, oh, it's maybe a little too loud, too fast, too slow and go back and do it again. So that's the artistic process is to be able to hold an image of the whole, in this case, the whole watershed while looking at a very specific place in the watershed. So we use the cairns to mark a specific place, but still calling on the issues that affect the whole of the watershed. And those dots you saw represent places where we have temporarily placed cairns. And cairn, the word cairn refers to the kinds of stacks of rocks that hikers will leave on a trail to mark the trail, or maybe as a memorial um, of some event or person. And we do something similar uh, here in my studio that you can see behind me, stacks of glass. And I use those to build cairns, uh, assemble stacks of glass into a marker or cairn. And then we load them in Josh's van and drive uh, along beside the rivers on uh, bumpy gravel roads and whatever. And there you can see Josh in the lower right hand corner stalking a wild cairn. And if you have a chance or in further interest, uh, Channel 9's Living St. Louis did a video of our, our work on the Merrimack River. So you can kind of see more about how we collaborate with uh, environmentalists and conservationists in selecting our sites. And I think uh, Jen's gonna put this link in the uh, chat if you wanna look at it later. So we started in 2011 in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And after working there for about five years, we realized that all the water that we were representing in the St. Louis metro area came from the um, Mississippi River in the North. So in 2016, we headed to Lake Itasca and uh, started placing these cairns temporarily again uh, in, in or by the water or riverside. Um, and this, some of you may have been here, this is Lake Itasca where the Mississippi River originates at this shallow place that you can walk across on rocks or um, the water's just up to your ankles if you, if you wanna wade. So this is the process. Um, we um, build, to choose a cairn for the location from the stack that's in the van and then assemble it at a place that's hopefully tells a story more about the, the region about the connection between the people, the plants and animals, the hydrology, the politics, the history. Um, so this is in Minnesota at St. Cloud, Minnesota in a park. And you may wanna see what the finished piece looks like there on the right. So we call this piece pointer. And 500 miles later, we're at Minneapolis. Um, this surprised me uh, that the origin of the Mississippi River flows some, as a braided river. Sometimes it even has a name of a lake, Lake Pepin, um, before it gets to Minneapolis. And this is uh, St. Anthony's Falls, call it uh, St. Anthony's Torch, it's the name of this piece. And this is where uh, in geological time or the, there was a 49 foot waterfall, beautiful waterfall, and the name Minnehaha, beautiful water. Um, and in 1963, they built a huge dam that began the now called Navigable River. And we're gonna quickly slide down, um, just showing you representative sample of some of the more than 400 images we've made on the rivers. 
This is in uh, Alma, near Alma, Wisconsin. And you might wonder about the, how, it, why does it glow? And it, it glows because we put the kinds of little LED lights that you might use in your closet. Um, you touch them and they go on and um, to, to light the piece. And we had this piece set up waiting for it to be dark enough for a long exposure. And that globe at the top was not bright enough. And so uh, I grabbed my phone and turned it on and put my phone in the, in the top piece. So that's why the light is somewhat blue and we could only photograph as long as the, the battery held. So here we are in Linksville, Wisconsin. So we're heading down uh, to past where the Wisconsin River joins the Mississippi. And it, takes, it might take a minute to see the cairn here, but if you've had experience with those old docks that uh, are built on uh, the drums, 55 gallon drums, then you know how bouncy it was to get the cairn out there and stacked. Go ahead and ask questions at any point. Um, so here we are um, in uh, Iowa, and this is Clinton, Iowa. And this piece is called Lily Pads. And it is actually in the water, the stuff on the bottom that looks like mud or dirt is actually tiny water plants floating at the base of these lily pads. We also take pictures of places that are not so pretty um, to remind us that uh, how we build junkyards and factories and all kinds of places that pollute. Um, this is in Keokuk, Iowa. Now we're down to the St. Louis region. This is Elsa, Illinois in the flood of 2013. So again, it's another time where you kind of have to focus to find the cairn, which in a larger image, you might be able to see the way it's reflecting the clouds uh, in the top of that big bubble-like cairn. But this is, we're standing on, uh, on a road uh, and the, the water is up to our chests um, and hence and the bridge is, and the river road is that line off to the right. And we went back a lot of, sometimes we will go back to record the same location at a different time. And this is in the flood of 2019. And our aim was to go back to the same site, but the water was so much higher there. We were up um, more in the, the bluff, up the bluff um, in order to take this picture uh, or we would drown if we went down. And here we are at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri. This is in West Alton. Um, if you're familiar with the Audubon Center at Riverlands. This is just beyond that. And we're looking uh, across the Mississippi into Illinois at dawn. And then heading on, um, this is Shoto Island, a swamp that floods, that as a lot of the land around the Mississippi River did before we built our levees and retaining structures to keep it straight and narrow. And here we're in South St. Louis County. This is uh, near Cliff Cave Park. And you're looking towards the Mississippi River and the Jefferson Barracks Bridge. The Trail of Tears figures very strongly in the Mississippi and Ohio River um, experience. 
And here, this is the Trail of Tears Park uh, near Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, as we go farther south, we see a lot of cypress swamps, um, such as this one at Miller City, Illinois, on the Horseshoe Lake. And when we print these photographs, we usually print them very large so you can feel like you're at the place and can see the details of the cairns as you can in the blow up on the right. Now yeah. we've, re we've reached the Ohio River. Um, you were looking up the Ohio River at Cairo, Illinois, at the point where the two rivers, the Mississippi and the Ohio meet. And the Mississippi uh, River doesn't have as much water in it as the Ohio at this point. So we chose to make a very big, heavy cairn to mark this place. So then we headed up the Ohio River. And this was in 2020. We got a, a window when everybody was relatively healthy. Um, and we headed up the Ohio River. This is in uh, old Leavenworth, Kansas. A lot of these towns on the Ohio River had the remnants, the effects of a giant flood in 1937. And this old town, Leavenworth, was where the town had been in 1937. But all that remained were some retaining walls and steps down to the river and one big, massive old brick house. The town of Leavenworth now is um, a little on, built on higher ground. The elevation here is 380 feet as we head up the Ohio River. And here, this is uh, Riverview Park in Louisville, Kentucky. And on the right, you can see this cairn as I built it in the studio. And you'll notice if you look at it, there's slight difference. The other components have been added to make it a little taller to fit in this particular place. We have two questions, Libby. Sure. The first one is, how do the seasons affect the spots you choose to photograph? OK. Well, um, we have not done much photographing in uh, the really cold weather, the, de the December, January, February weather. Um, what we have done in the one thing we have discovered is that when glass gets very cold, you only have to tap it and it breaks. Um, so stacking glass, we have been very careful not to break and leave glass shards. But we do try to get a variety of seasons to photograph in. And um, this is in October, so. Uh, we got some some nice color. We had hoped for more color, um, but it, uh, it was a late fall. Great. Um, and then the second question is, how do you choose the specific location? Okay. Well, this is a good one to to talk about that with because this is um, Clifty Falls State Park, and the there are six waterfalls at in this park they're they're beautiful but we what we require is an interesting foreground and a place that's relatively flat or can be leveled um, because it's essential since we're building and stacking these things that the first one go down and be perfectly level so that we don't topple as we go so while we would have liked to have had the um, water, a waterfall in the background, 
there just wasn't a place that had an interesting foreground and uh, the composition of the whole photo. Um, so you just have to go to the park yourself to see the waterfalls. I hope that, does that answer the question? If not. Yeah, I think that answered it beautifully. Okay, let's, let's go on. So when we exhibit these and on the website, I invite you to go to the website, see some more work. Um, we identify the location, both its kind of physical address, and then also its uh, latitude and longitude and elevation. And the reason for this is that we hope that some of you will go to this place in different seasons or um, after a flood or in drought or um, you know, whatever, and be able to see this place as it changes and um, you know, whatever, whatever happens. And, and this is also this particular place I chose to show you the copy on because many of these places are not just one thing. I mean, this is a, a nature conservancy, but it's behind the loading dock of a casino and it's adjacent to an archeological um, institute, research institute. So it's all of these things. It's not nature as it was or as we imagine it to be, but it's our contemporary society and there's much to be learned of, about the people who were here before us. So they're markers that kind of mark time and as well as place. Um, so a lot of the area um, in, in Ohio is just really beautiful parks. This is near um, Forked Run State Park. And here we are in Marietta, um, Ohio. And this is part of the Hamar Historic District, which was its own little town, and it maintains its historic character. And what was notable about it was this railroad bridge that went across the river to Marietta. And it was a kind of bridge that the track in the middle that went over the river swung open to let ships through and then swung back. Um, and there's hopes to turn it into a pedestrian uh, trail. It's not operating now. And here we are uh, almost to Pittsburgh. Um, it, at the Riverfront Park in Rochester, Pennsylvania. So we call this piece um, the Night Fishers. You can maybe see on the docked sort of to the right of the picture, there's a, a fisher person and a man and his daughter. The, the daughter is kind of in his arms. She, you can't, can't tell she's there anymore. But um, in addition to the pleasure boats that are uh, lighting up the river on the left and the various bridges, um, I would point out the red glow in the distance. It is a sunset, but it's also sun reflecting on the pollution from Steubenville, Ohio. And uh, there's a, a kind of sulfuric odor all around this area due to the heavy manufacturing. Okay, so now very quickly, I'm gonna take you down the um, Missouri River because the Mississippi River, that is the Missouri River to St. Louis and then down to the Gulf is 3,700 odd miles long. The Mississippi River itself is 2,230 miles long. So by measuring the 
Miss Missouri Mississippi River from its origin um, in the Centennial Mountains of Montana, where it connects to the Mississippi and onto the Gulf. Uh, it, that 3,700 miles makes it the fourth largest, longest river on Earth. So um, it's really the Mississippi, Ohio, Missouri River watershed. So we, the, if you, the upper, each one of these dots, as I said before, represents a place that we've made a cairn. So this upper area here is all the Missouri River that goes up into, basically almost into Canada. And the lower dots are the Arkansas, not Arkansas, blanking. Two of the major tributaries are represented as they come in. And here we are at the start of the Missouri River in the Centennial Mountains. And at this point, the spring is feeding what is called the Hell Roaring Creek, which becomes the Jeff, oops, which becomes the Jefferson, uh, the Jefferson River. And they it joins the Madison and the Gallatin at Three Forks. And these rivers got their names by from Lewis and Clark, who ended their journey at Three Forks. And um, so they, that's kind of the official start of the Missouri River. But actually, the longest distance water comes from the Centennial Mountains. And, goes down this hell roaring creek. And I hope you've found the cairn. It's just in front of that little bush there. Gives you an idea of the scale of these places. And then we're jumping quickly to um, the uh, Canyon Ferry Dam. And this is near Helena, Montana. And the dams are really an important part of the story of these rivers. Um, they were created beginning in the 1930s to um, aid navigation, basically, the locks and dams. And some of in additional benefits, some of them produce hydropower. They have lakes, they impound lakes behind them, which are re recreation districts. and. Um, but their, their, their reason for being is to make sure that the flow on the river is constant for shipping. So this dam, uh, Canyon Ferry, is the second Missouri River dam of 15 dams on the Missouri River. So it's just some beautiful views in Glacier National Park, Montana. There's in Billings, Montana. Another part of the story of the Missouri River is the oil industry. Uh, Billings, Montana, we're looking in, in downtown, the older part of the town, and looking at one of the refineries. There are five refineries within the city limits of Billings, Montana. Just to give you an idea of how pervasive that industry is in, in that and other towns. Another reminder of the native people, this um, cairn it, called Crystal Sunset is at the First People's Buffalo State Jump Park. <laughs> Buffalo Jump State Park, First People's Buffalo Jump State Park, um, where the native people drove the buffalo over a cliff as a means of hunting them. And pollinators welcome. The large part of the Dakotas in Montana um, is farmland. And here, this is uh, canola, the, the rapeseed plant, canola. And this is the Last shot we did in 2017, we reached the, um, the bridge where the no Detroit, no 
Detroit Access Pipeline protests, um, the water protectors um, held the area for a while to stop a pipeline that was to go under the lake from which they get their drinking water. And we were there about a year after the um, people ha had met, the water protectors met the government officials and declared the end of their protest. The, the legal battle for that, whether that pipeline is legal or not is ongoing, although it's in operation. And here are some of those quintessential badlands um, in South Dakota. This is um, called Bringing Down the Sky, the Badlands National Park. I bet you can't guess what date this was taken. Um, uh, it was at the, um, Fort Pierre, which is across the river from Pierre, South Dakota. And this was July 4th, 2018. This piece is called Shannon Shows Up. Can't go anywhere along the Missouri River without something being dedicated to Lewis and Clark. It's, it's like Lincoln slept here. Lewis and Clark slept everywhere along the Mississippi, the Missouri River. And this name of this Piece, Shannon shows up comes from a historic plaque at the site and it's commemorating when Lewis and Clark's private George Shannon who'd been missing for two weeks showed up and caught up with the group. It's hard to imagine how in that wilderness he could find um, the journey of discovery. My association with Nebraska, Nebraska is farmland, but it's also the home to one huge lake called, surprisingly enough, Lewis and Clark Lake in Santee, Nebraska. Here's the bridge at Decatur and where this cairn is sitting would have been underwater in the 2011 flood. The bridge was closed. Um, because the water was so high on both sides of the river. The Milky Way in Hamburg, Iowa. Here's the highway bridge at St. Joe, St. Joseph's, Missouri. And um, if the camera could pan out to the right, you would see uh, older brick warehouse type buildings and to the left a small nice nature walkway uh, where you can walk out to see the river but so many of our cities like St. Louis we put the highway between the people and the river here's just a country road can't you hear John Denton and that's in Br Brunswick, Brunswick Missouri and this is the Rocheport River Walk. And because of um, Austin, uh, I think of River Walk as an entertainment district. This is just one long walk to get to where you can see the river. Uh, and it's a beautiful view, it's worth the walk. And here we are at St. Charles, Missouri, where we're very close to the confluence of the river. And this is at Echo Park. It's an area of St. Charles, an older part of the city where um, it flooded in, in 93 and other times. And the city bought out the property and turned it into a kind of a nature walk called Echo Park. And here we are back at that confluence. This is um, taken the same day as this shot you saw earlier, but this time we're looking south and the Missouri River is coming in on your right. The Mississippi River is coming in on your left. And what's straight ahead on the other side of the Cairn is an island. It's not, the rivers have, have effectively merged and you can see them 
merging because of the different colors of the, the water and they kind of maintain that different coloration, but the name of the river now is the Mississippi River, which very quickly now we'll, we're in 2021 and we're gonna make the sprint down from uh, the Ohio River to the Gulf. So are you ready? <laughs> here we go. So here we're at Bird's Blue Hole. This is um, on Bird's Point, Levy Road near Charleston, Missouri. And these levees were built with the intention of being destroyed so that the water from a flooding Mississippi River could take the pressure off the towns downstream. And that has happened twice in the history of this uh, Birds Point floodway. It was blasted in the flood of 1937 and again in 2011. Um, so that's, that's one strategy that ha has been used in, because we have contained the river in such a small area, rather than allowing it to meander and spill out softly into the fields. Uh, we've claimed more land for farms and built levees and uh, the water, when there's a big rainstorm, has got to go somewhere. And levees and blasting the levees is our current solution. And here's another point along the river that has that kind of a connection. So this levee at Dorena um, in Missouri, it, it blew of its own in the flood of 1927, a, a break in the levee, and it, that break flooded 175,000 acres. And this, while it's not a stellar cairn or beautiful image is significant because it's uh, one of the rare accesses uh, to the river in, um, in Mississippi. Um, because there are levees on both sides and uh, on the other side of the river uh, of the levee, between the levee and the river, it's frequently a commercial um, venue, either a port or uh, in some cases a factory. Um, this is at a, a park um, where people can get their boats into the Mississippi River. And here's another view of those levees. Uh, we're actually up on a levee here, looking down at um, the Flower Lake Road. So this is Levee Road and uh, up here where the cairn is and down below is Flower Lake Road. And they're on the levee, uh, which on this one you can drive, but as you go farther and farther south, you're not able to get on the levee road. It's official vehicles only, um, but they wanna make sure that the cattle and horses um, don't go too far on the levee road here. So cattle guard. When we initially started setting this cairn up, there were horses in that field to the left, um, but because balancing the cairn was so difficult on this metal cattle guard, uh, by the time we got it set up, the horses had moved on. And this is another uh, set of evidence of the native people who lived in this area in the past. These are the Winterville Mounds in Greenville, Mississippi. So a similar culture, same time frame as the Cahokia Mounds in the St. Louis area. Um, there are 12 mounds existing here. We saw a, a lot of other mounds marked, um, but not, um, not not turned into a park. Uh, so along, all, all along the Mississippi River, there are these mounds um, that 
Native people built in the Mississippian culture. And behind the cairn is a wooden replica of um, the kinds of canoes that people used on uh, the rivers to trade from Florida to uh, Michigan. And here we are in a, a cypress swamp in Louisiana, in Lake Providence, Louisiana. And this is a cairn that we used um, formerly, you saw it before in Minnesota. But we brought a lot of cairns with us along the lower Mississippi. So um, just like some piece of uh, plastic, my drink cup that I toss in the river up here in um, Illinois gets washed down. We, we brought our cairns down, not to wash them in the river, but uh, to express that. And this, it's barely readable, but the name of this town on the water tower there is waterproof. And this is significant to the town because they named it waterproof, but they had to move it three times after they instituted the town because it kept getting flooded. And it's now protected on three sides by um, levees. And I'm very curious as to whether we were photographing in July of uh, 2021, in July 28th to be exact for this one. And a month and a day later, the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ida hit and um, flooded uh, much of Southern Louisiana. Now, our GPS read that the elevation at this point was 70 feet. So whether it reflooded, um, I don't know, because a lot of the places farther south, the elevation reads at 10 feet. So this is three views of the same cairn uh, on the deck of a very interesting building from uh, LSU's uh, sustainability, Coastal Sustainability Institute, which is tied in with the university in studying how to deal with the, the flooding and other issues on, on, the, on the coast. I'd never seen sugarcane before. This is at El Edgard, Louisiana. And again, this is where the elevation starts reading 10 feet. So might very well have been swamped. Here we are next to St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans. And this, this is one month before the hurricane hit. And the only water we saw was the puddle on the left. But I'm sure that changed drastically in a month. This is Point Burris, and these are just a few of the commercial fishing boats that were um, moored at this port. And that's kind of how I picture the Gulf. Um, this is what we actually saw a lot of. So now we are um, near, near the southernmost point of roads in Louisiana. Um, and this is Targa Resources, a big sign proclaimed Targa Resources. And they deal in oil, natural gas, LP gas, and crude oil. And in August 2020, they declared a quarter quarterly earning of 3.48 billion. Um, so this is just one of the many oil industries that line uh, the Gulf. 
And here's another beautiful view, roadside view. But um, if you can see at the bottom of the picture, that's the road and the, the water is um, there's a steep drop and the water is just right at the road. Um, and that's what it, what it's like there. So this brings us to the last place on the Louisiana, the last road, end of the road. Um, and with love and gratitude for the Mississippi, Ohio, and Missouri rivers, uh, we say goodbye. So thank you for listening. And if you have any other questions or observations, I'd love to hear them. Thank you, Libby, for that great presentation. We do have a couple questions that popped up um, while you were speaking. So the first one is, how do you decide which cairns are placed at each location? So do you drive to the place before and plan it? Or did you just stack everything in the van and kind of read the landscape and find out what might work best? Well, originally when we were just doing things around St. Louis, we would um, visit, plan, and come back with a cairn. But on these trips, um, which are anywhere from a week to, to two plus weeks, um, we think about what it's probably gonna look like. I make a lot of cairn parts and we assemble them in response to a particular place. Should we use the red one here? No, not here. <laughs> A little bit of both. You kind of have an idea, but then you let the landscape speak for itself and use your art in the landscape. Correct. And then our other question was a more specific one, but what size is the cairn in the Badlands photo, photo bringing down the sky? It looks like it must be huge on that rise. So what is the average size of the cairns? And if you know the size of that one, how tall was it? Yeah, um, I, I'd have to look, but uh, maybe we can look at the cairns in, in front here. So the, the cairn on the right, which was used in the sugar cane, is tall enough. Um, sometimes there's another section that goes on it. It's tall enough that uh, I'm five two and Josh is much taller. So he will have to put the it, it, it's about 72 inches tall, maybe 82. Um, and so he has to put the top piece on generally. Um, but they can be as small as um, 30 inches. But then we have the option of stacking more to make it taller. So they are um, the to aunt, try and answer that question, I would guess that that piece is probably about five feet tall the, in the touching the sky. Wonderful. And then we just had one last question that says, um, can you mention Josh's books on the Karens? And I can actually add the link to one of the books that I have. Um, right into the chat. Okay, and here it is, but it'll probably be easier to copy it from the, um, from the chat. So there's the book on the upper Mississippi. And we have plans to do uh, five total lower Mississippi next and, and two on the Missouri and one on the Ohio. Wonderful. And the questions keep rolling in. So if we have anyone in the audience that has any questions, feel free. We have just a few moments left. And our next question is, how many elements are in a common, common unit that you can stack? So do you normally use three, four, five, or really does it depend? 
Uh, well, it, it somewhat depends, but the, the basic rule is that they, a grouping has to be um, no more than, I think it's 23 inches, because that's what will fit in the back of my car. Um, so but obviously Josh's van is taller, but um, that it, it, they end up, and so it might be three, it could be four. Frequently the topper piece is a, is a separate piece, like the Karen you're looking at, there's kind of a round piece on the top. That, that would be a separate piece. Wonderful. And I know that this isn't really a part of the talk necessarily, but how do you make these pieces? So how do you make each of the individual sections? Um, I assemble them and I glue them or here's, here's the glue that I use. Can you see it? E6000. It's kind of glued to this piece of paper right now. So that's the glue, or I also have um, some UV glue that uh, you apply and then you use the uh, UV light to activate it. Wonderful. Well, it doesn't seem like, well, we got one last question and I think this will be our last one. Um, and then we can wrap up for the evening. So will there be any future um, exhibits of the Cairns and the giant photos in the future. So are you looking at more places to host these photos? Well, yes, we hope to. Um, we do have, our next project is the Illinois River and we have an exhibit planned for 2023-24 at the National Great Rivers Museum that will compare historic black and white photos uh, of the area with the, the new uh, watershed cairns images that we will make. So, yeah, we're very excited. I'm sure everyone joining us tonight is really excited to see all those extra photos come in from the Illinois River and get to learn more about these places that we might not be able to visit in person, but we can experience through this art. And thank you, Libby, for your great presentation. It was really nice to see all the photos. Um, everyone saying thank you, beautiful photos in the chat. Um, and if there are no other questions, I do wanna make a point that we do have uh, neighbor nights coming up in February. It will be about pruning trees because it might not seem like it, but this is the time of year that you wanna actually prune trees and shrubs. So Emily Ely will be giving that presentation from Trees Forever. You can look at our Facebook in the next few weeks and I'll have that all posted. So stay tuned and we hope to see you in the future at either our virtual neighbor nights or our in-person neighbor nights. So thank you Libby one more time and everyone else have a great evening and enjoy the rest of your week.